Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Valerie Anderson, your Policy and Legislation Chair for the Pine Lily Chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. Uh, I am pleased to introduce today Kara Driscoll, a milkweed researcher. She is not on video, but we do have a great presentation. She's joining us by phone, and her laptop is streaming the presentation. So I hope you guys are ready for some milkweed goodness. Kara, take it away. Through uh, oh, as much of this present. I'm not muted on. My it was totally oh, me. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, cool. Just making sure. Yeah, because I'm I'm not muted on my headset here. So um, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to do my best to get through this. Um, there is a lot of information to cover. So I'm going to do my best to make this um, a nice overview, mainly of uh, milkweed ecology and some of the milkweeds you can find in Central Florida, at least within, you know, a few counties of Osceola County. So um, first things first, uh, whenever you somebody talks about milkweed, the first thing they think of is generally the monarch. And or if you mention to somebody, you know, what butterfly they do they know or like what their favorite butterfly is or, you know, name a butterfly, it's always the monarch, right? And as I stated previously, you know, they, most everybody knows that they eat milkweed, but few people know that Florida has about 21 species of milkweeds. And, um, you know, few, few, I feel like even fewer people know anything about their like biology or ecology. So today we are uh, not going to talk a lot about the monarch because I feel like almost every presentation about monarchs and actually rather milkweeds um, focuses a lot on monarch biology and how much they use it and how um, they're suffering, but not, oops not nearly enough on milkweeds in general. So we're gonna do our, our, our best to cover it and <sighs> there's quite a bit. So again, this is, this is kind of me and my attitude when, when I try to talk about milkweeds and people try to direct me towards monarch um, uh, biology and ecology. That's not my expertise. It's, it's honestly straight milkweed. And uh, you know, this is kind of what, <laughs> I just have to laugh whenever I think about this because most people, again, focus on milkweeds mainly because of their benefit to the monarch. They don't ever think about like where milkweeds are in the ecosystem, what purpose they serve, et cetera, what their adaptations are, anything like that. It's always in context of the monarch. Kind of drives me nuts, but anyway, that's okay though. So I'm not even gonna uh, break down the image on the right, but um, when it comes to kind of like uh, the taxonomy and phylogeny, milkweeds are found in the dogbane family and they're in a subfamily called uh, Asclepiodoidae, um, which is, so the Apocynaceae is one of the top 10 uh, largest plant families. And it's a plant family that's pretty much found worldwide um, and the highest diversity is in the tropics and subtropics. And there's also just an incredible array of like morphological diversity. Um, there are some trees, shrubs, vines, like woody vines. Um, there's also a huge amount of succulent diversity that you can see in um, Apocynaceae too. A lot of them are super duper cool, but again, not what we're about today. Um, the one thing that you wanna keep in mind about milkweeds is that, um, or at least this family slash subfamily is that they're most intensely studied for their pollination biology, um, as well as the plant herbivore at, um, interactions and secondary chemistry. So in other words, like the chemicals that they make, the majority of the plants, I, uh, at least in the subfamily Asclepioidae, definitely are poisonous. Um, some of the other native genera that are closely related to milkweeds are um, genus, or the genera are Matalea, Gonolobus, Sinicum, Funastrum, Metastoma, Orthogia, Petalius, and among a few others. So in general, milkweeds are charismatic plants, which honestly, if you look at all their flowers, they're just super dang cool to me. Um, and they're typically found in grasslands and other open habitats in North America and Africa. There's over 130 species in North America and they're named for the milky latex that's secreted when they're damaged. Um, they are herbaceous uh, perennials. They Rarely, I don't think they ever have woody stems, no. 
they don't. Um, but they're def I honestly think a lot of them are long lived perennials. Um, and leaves in general are usually like opposite. So they're in a pair along the stem and they'll alternate often up the stem. Occasionally they are also sub opposite. So you'll have a pair of leaves and then like a single leaf and then another pair of leaves. And then world, world just means there's more than one leaf at that uh, point in the stem. Um, they have pinnate venation and entire margins. So with entire margins, that, that just means that there's no like kind of scalloped edging or like uh, breaks in that edge. It's just a smooth edge. Um, flowers are held in umbels, which is kind of like that uh, floral arrangement you see on the right. Um, and there can be anywhere between two to 30 flowers per um, flower cluster or umbel, depending on the species. And um, the fruits in general resemble kind of like smooth okra or green beans, in my opinion, and they're mostly held up and or straight up and down or upright, except for um, Asclepius perennis, AKA our aquatic milkweed, which ha hangs down. Um, so here's some examples of what we're talking about. On the left here, you can see the opposite, the alternating opposite leaf arrangement I was talking about before. Um, you can see in the middle there with Asclepius longifolia, the sub opposite leaf arrangement, there's, um, you can see the paired leaves and some with, um, you know, the occasional singular leaf at a node. And then on the far right is the world leaf arrangement that you'll see or that you can see in um, Asclepius verticillata. So now I'm going to go get into reproduction. So most plants have um, loose pollen and a lot of people see, you know, insects and bees kind of just doing their thing in uh, most nectar plants like you see in the, the little image there. So you have this nice, uh, I think this is a carpenter bee, kind of um, just going to town, going ham, getting um, that pollen and his nectar um, while getting uh, pollen rubbed over um, its back. But this is not what happens in milkweeds. Milkweeds are different. They have a very complex floral morphology and kind of biology that rivals orchids actually. So, um, so here's the overall basic structure of most milkweeds and it kind of varies in shape and size again across species. Um, but down here at the bottom, you have the corolla, which is all the petals that are generally mostly recurved, meaning bent backwards. Um, up top, this whole structure up here is called the corona. Um, I don't know if I, can you see my mouse or my, oh, my cursor, perfect. Okay, so this is, this whole thing is called the corona. And then what you have here are the hoods. So that's these kinds of, these cup-like organs here um, with the horn. That's where nectar is produced. So at the base of the horn in these like inside of the hoods is where nectar is produced. And that's where insects are going to visit and actually get nectar from. Um, and the outside of these are really, really slippery. So, and then this is where the business happens. So here you have the stigmatic slit. This is where um, pollinia is inserted. And this is the top or the joining point of what we call um, pollinium, pollinia, oh, I think pollinia is plural. And then this, the technical term here is corpusculum. So this joins the two um, sacs of pollinia. So in other words, the pollen is not loose. It is in a nice little capsule. And each capsule has um, the amount of, the exact amount of pollen grains that is needed to pollinate every single seed in an ovary. So an insect needs to kind of, when it lands on the flower, it tries to grab onto the outside of those hoods and can't get a grip. So those hoods guide the insect legs in between to, um, to that stigmatic slit. Leg gets stuck, they try to pull it out, um, and then it gets caught on the corpusculum, and then that ends up pulling um, the uh, pollinia out. And when they're pulled out first thing, um, they tend to lay flat, and I'll get to that in a second. But here you can see um, how different species have different shapes or different shaped pollinia. This actually helps reduce chances of hybridization. Um, and I just, it's kind of like a lock and key in a sense. And I just, this is just a really cool image to me. Um, so here's a short video um, showing you like kind of typical foraging behavior. <clears throat> And over here on the, uh, the right, you can see like a, a still image that I've pulled from here where you can see him like this wasp daintily um, showing us the pollinia that he collected. 
So again, the insect will land on it, try to uh, get some nectar or juice or whatever from the flower and um, the, uh, his legs will slide in between there, get caught, and he has to pull his legs through in order to actually get the uh, pollinia caught on its um, legs. So moving on, I'm, and here it is happening again in Asclepius fei, which was, is uh, the species of my uh, study. Um, and it's really, really, really hard to see here, but um, the pollinia can get, most, is mostly caught on legs, but it can also get caught on other body parts, uh, sometimes the mouth parts here, as you can see with this. Um, not sure what kind of wasp this is, it's some kind of thread-waisted wasp, I believe but he kind of bends down, um, I guess, tries to get nectar out of um, some of the really low hoods here and then um, zips off. So for insects, um, this means that pollination can be kind of dangerous since the legs do get caught. Um, the insect has to be big enough and strong enough to remove itself in order to successfully take the pollinia out. If it can't do that, it's gonna get stuck and die. So here we have a bee stuck on, well, these are all from Fei. So got a bee, got an ant. Um, and that one was a close call there. Um, but assuming everything goes well and um, the insect forages to another plant um, and manages to get the pollinia inserted, will have a um, successful pollination and fruit set. Um, and I'll get to this. Th this is actually kind of or pretty hard for a lot of insects to do. And the chances of um, reproduction or successful pollination per flower are actually pretty low. And I'll get to that in a second. So yay, good job. Gold star, you did it. Congratulation. And here it is with, again, Asclepius fei. Um, so once that pollinia is inserted into that little stigmatic slit there, there's like uh, some nectar or juice in there that uh, stimulates the pollen tubes to grow and they grow into the ovary, fertilizing all the seeds in that ovary. So even though the chances of pollination or successful pollination per flower are really low, when it does happen, it, you're, the plant is pretty much guaranteed to have you know, an entire fruit filled with seed. And when the cool thing about milkweeds too is you can actually notice uh, if you have a successfully pollinated uh, seed pod forming. So right here on um, this is Clepius tomentosa, you'll have on the left here you have one um, flower that definitely didn't get pollinated, so it's like really skinny. He's kind of you know just hanging out there, and eventually that'll fall off. But here you have um, three different flowers that got pollinated, and they you can tell because this is thickening; it's starting to curve downward, and you're starting to get this the nice little bean pod or uh, bean pod shape forming. Um, and fr fruit maturation varies between species and can range from anywhere between um, about a month, I want to say, or a month and a half for Pedicillata to around nine months for Variegata. And that's like kind of crazy to me because it's almost like that that plant is like gestating a baby or rather in that case, probably like a hundred babies in a seed pod. So, and that's what it looks like um, when it opens and as before all the seeds kind of blow off. Um, and here it is like before it opens with all the seeds like nicely packed in um, waiting to uh, start drying out and blow off into the wild. So most milkweeds in general are self incompatible. Um, that means that, um, so unlike, you know, maybe some vegetable species or some other, you know, wildflower species where you can just take like a little paintbrush and if you don't have any others, you just take the, um, the paintbrush and just rub it on the flower a bit and rub it around and it'll set seed for itself. You can't, even if you did that for milkweeds, like knowing what we know about its uh, reproductive biology, uh, if you tried to self it, that wouldn't work. Um, there's only like maybe one or two species or native species that have a chance of successful selfing, but even then it's going to result in reduced seed set. And that's because they um, tend to suffer from what's called inbreeding depression. Meaning if you try to make a cross or have a cross between like an adult and an offspring, you're gonna get reduced seed set. Same thing with a sibling cross. You're also going to get reduced seed set. So 
um, in order for milkweeds to have successful, like good seed set, they need to have an outcross with, um, you know, a uh, genetically distinct individual in that population. Um, and for, I, I'm using this as a baseline and there's, cause there's a paper that nicely breaks down, like, you know, the average amount of flowers that each species produces, the average amount of seed pods, the average amount, average amount of seeds in those seed pods, et cetera. Um, so I took a lot of those numbers and kind of broke it down for a bunch of the species. Um, and for that particular rate right there, so the chances of successful pollination being about 1% or one in 100 flowers, um, that baseline, I use that as a baseline for most of the species in Florida, and that mainly applies to Asclepias tuberosa. Um, and that uh, baseline or those that baseline chance um, can vary either higher or lower depending on species. Frankly, I think it'd be cool if there was like, you know, future research that looked at that um, breakdown per species in Florida, but, you know, it all depends on if somebody wants to tackle that question and or they get funding. But I digress. So I just wanted to show some examples of uh, viable versus unviable seed. And I, it's kind of hard to tell in these pictures, but on the left here, you can tell um, you have, we have a viable seed and the viable seed is going to be like really full. Like when you hold it between your fingers, you're going to feel like an embryo or it feels like a, a little sunflower seed in that brown casing there. And on the right um, is the unviable seed. So if you try to hold that between your fingers, it's going to just be like completely empty or feel like paper essentially. And I tried to illustrate that by holding, these are just not great pictures, but um, on the left here, you can kind of see how it's um, the viable seed is full and the other, uh, the unviable seed is like very, very skinny and flat again, like paper. <clears throat> so one thing that um, milkweeds have adapted and evolved to do in order to avoid um, Excuse me, is that? You're okay, it's just the dogs. And I have my mic off for everybody in the audience, so. Perfect. You okay. can hear it, but they can't. Okay. So um, in order for milkweeds to, um, actually, let me back up here. So basically, it, it one thing that milkweeds have evolved in order to um, reduce the chances of selfing and increase the chances of outcrossing is that um, when the pollinia is removed, it comes out, you know, kind of just flat. Basically, both arms attached to that little black bead there are at a 180 degree angle. Um, but they kind of have to dry or rotate into position before they can be inserted. Um, so as you can see here on the right, this is an image I took um, during a plant systematics class where I was able to remove pollinia from two different species. Um, we have Asclepius perennis um, as the excuse me, the smaller, oops, sheesh, sorry, I scrolled there, um, as the smaller one. And then this is Asclepius curasavica here, this uh, non-native scarlet milkweed that everyone likes to use for food for monarchs. Um, but as you can kind of see in the picture there, it's actually already rotated and at an angle there. So basically that's, that's pretty much ready to go um, for insertion. That is if it's attached to a bug's leg. Um, so because of that delay, and then on top of that, we also have um, most studies that look at the different kinds of insects that forage on milkweeds show that there's actually a very wide variety of like different kinds of bees, wasps, butterflies, sometimes beetles, et cetera, that all forage. And all those species kind of have different foraging patterns, different foraging times, et cetera. So you combine the diversity of species visiting milkweed flowers with the fact that the milkweed um, pollinia has to basically quote dry um, after it's removed before it can be reinserted. This basically results in truly random pollination within a population, um, which I think is just like mind blowingly cool that like, you know, a plant has figured out how to make something like this random and increase uh, chances of successful outcrossing. So basically this means that um, if you have two milkweeds next to each other and like another one 20 yards away, they have an equal chance of pollinating each other. They don't have to, you don't have to plant them next to each other in order to get seed set. Um, and in fact, it actually might be a little bit better if you spread them apart in your garden or if you're trying to plant them and trying to get seed that is. Um, the other big advantage of having um, the 
pollen in a nice little package there is that insects can't eat it. So a lot of insects visit flowers um, to eat the pollen as well as the nectar because pollen is full of all kinds of good nutrients um, for insects. So because they can't access it and it's just stuck on their body somewhere, mainly with their legs, they end up carrying it, you know, not just like within the acre, but sometimes up to a, a half a mile or maybe a mile or more. Again, this depends on how far these different insects forage. So here's kind of an example of um, what I thought or might be. Um, th so we have three different populations here of Asclepius fei, and these are uh, points that I've taken. Um, so if we have a species of insect that's capable or um, is likely to kind of forge between these, it's, there are, is a chance for um, gene flow in between these populations. So the other thing I wanted to touch on before is that, um, or actually I touched on it before, is that even though we have, um, like each species has its own shape of pollinia, um, that's meant to limit um, uh, hybridization between species, but just because it's highly limited doesn't mean it doesn't happen um, between milkweed species. It's just super duper rare. So here's an example of a hybrid that um, we've recorded in Florida. This is um, this is a picture taken by Floyd Griffith, and it's a hybrid between um, Asclepius implexicollis or clasping milkweed and Asclepius obovata or pinewoods milkweed. And you can kind of see the um, resemblance between the two parents here. So on the left here is Implexicollis. You can see the, the leaves kind of really, really hugging the stem here. And the really long um, peduncle here, pedicel um, for the flower clusters. Um, and on the right here, it's kind of hard to see with just um, this one picture, but Opobata's um, flower clusters are um, pretty much always hugging the stem. And there's a small, uh, short flower stem here too. Um, so going back, you can kind of see the, it's a nice like almost 50-50 combination here between um, the two parents. So, and that's just a closer picture of the hybrid. I just thought, thought it was really cool. Um, and here's another example of a different hybrid that's found in, we don't have any examples of this in Florida. This is from North Carolina. And I just think it's one of the prettier ones. This is um, between Asclepius lanceolata and Asclepius rubra, just super duper pretty here. I think um, obviously this particular picture kind of leans more towards the um, lanceolata or few flower milkweed rather than the rubra. But anyway, moving on. So, this kind of um, harkens back to what I was talking about before, how everybody hyper focuses on the monarch because, you know, everybody starts adapting their gardens for, well, mainly butterflies, but that kind of like, I won't say it, it doesn't drive other insects out, but, you know, if, you, if you're going to pollinate your garden, I think it's best to try to get as many different pollinator species as possible or help as many as possible in your garden. Um, and this is just kind of <laughs> summing up the whole thing here. Cause another thing that I see happen is that a lot of people really don't realize that, uh, monarchs, um, and queen butterflies too. And if you're in South Florida, like I am soldier butterflies, those three, um, butterflies aren't the only things that can, that are host obligates to meet milkweed, meaning they can only eat milkweed. There, there's several other um, insect species or genera that like only feed on milkweed. And what kind of drives me nuts is that when they pop up in, in the garden, people are like, oh my God, what is this insect on my plant? Like, why is it here? This is, this just shouldn't be here. Should I squish them? And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but they're, they're native too. So we have the poor milkweed beetles and milkweed weevils struggling over here in the pool here. And then all the milkweed bugs are, and milkweed tussock moths, again, though they pretty much only eat milkweeds, you know, have drowned. So um, kind of touching more on some insect relationships here and some broader ecology, um, milkweeds are likely dependent on habitat her heterogeneity, meaning like a habitat mosaic or Again, in other words, um, having lots of different kinds of habitats in the vicinity of a population um, to increase their reproductive success. And they need that because sometimes the insects that are best at pollinating them 
don't grow or don't mature in the habitat that the milkweed occurs in. So few flower milkweed likes wet and moist areas and the three butterflies below normally don't, um, or they may mature in that habitat or those wettish habitats, but most of them don't. So they're visiting from adjacent habitats. So if you, you want to successfully conserve and like make a, have a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to make sure that um, milkweed populations you have on your property are having reproductive success, you want to have as many different kinds of habitats as possible, especially if they are healthy and intact. Um, so, and going back to what I said before, most milkweeds are pollinated by large bees, wasps, and a few different kinds of butterflies. Some other ones are also pollinated by beetles and occasionally flies. Um, and because milkweeds have just such a wide variety of like flower shapes and sizes and kind of like the way they're arranged on the flower and stuff, um, they may target like a specific tribe of insects um, that's kind of like their guaranteed pollinators. Um, whereas all the other species that visit those flowers are kind of like um, just added bonuses um, that further increase reproductive success. So moving on here, um, in general, milkweeds are just highly, um, outside of being food for monarchs, they're really, really good high quality nectar plants for a wide variety of insect species. Again, I already mentioned them before. Um, and besides monarchs and queens and soldiers, they're also host plants for a large number of, of other insects such as native milkweed bugs. Again, yes, these are native. And as I've also pointed out here, they also migrate like monarchs do. So if you see them on your milkweed trying to eat some seed pods, yeah, it kind of sucks, but you know, they're also a native species too, and they shouldn't be vilified while the monarch is glorified in, in my personal humble opinion. Um, another uh, genus of really cool beetles is it's genus Tetraopis here or milkweed beetles. We have one species that's found in Florida, but there's, um, I want to say at least half a dozen other species found across the United States. They strictly feed on milkweed. It's primarily the leaves and such. Um, and there's also milkweed weevils, which um, they don't, they're not really distinctive like the two insects that I have uh, shown here. They're uh, more drab and dull, kind of hard to ID, but they will lay an egg um, or some eggs on the stem and the larvae will burrow into the stem, eat the living tissue. So, so you may come across a milkweed that suddenly um, for no apparent reason, looks like it's dried up or died, likely due to a milkweed weevil kind of just doing its thing. Um, but again, these, these insects have co-evolved with milkweed just like monarchs have, and they deserve and are highly dependent upon milkweeds, again, just as much as monarchs. Um, so other insects, um, you can find a bunch of other kinds of insects that kind of visit milkweeds, you know, besides those uh, looking for nectar, there's some that'll land on here for um, hunting. So um, one of the pests on milkweed that a lot of people get are the um, yellow oleander aphids, but one of their biggest predators is serpent fly larvae, which is what you can see right here. Um, and here's what that looks like as an adult. Um, some other larvae are ladybug larvae and braconid wasps, and we'll see those in a second. So here's what a serpent high, surfed fly, excuse me, looks like as an adult, AKA it's also called the uh, hoverfly, another good pollinator to have. Um, and here's ladybug larva. Um, and here's bracketed wasps. So here's a little teeny tiny, as you can see how small it is, teeny tiny one kind of like acting like a ninja and laying an egg like right on in there on that um, oleander aphid. And so this is why I tell everybody, like if you have milkweeds and you're covered with oleander aphids, just leave them alone. Eventually some kind of braconid wasp is gonna come by and find them. And eventually your aphid infestation is going to turn into this. So these are all dead husks of um, aphids um, thanks to the braconid wasp. So some other stuff that visits milkweed, not necessarily to feed on it, but to kind of predate the caterpillars that it finds on there, um, are tachnid, tachnid, I think I pronounced that right, and chalcid wasps, which prey on the caterpillars. And on the right, um, that tall, long picture, you can kind of see the um, tachnid fly larva kind of hanging down at the bottom here. Kind of gross to look at. And I found an extra gross image of a, chals a bunch of chalcid wasps emerging from a, a monarch chrysalis. I just didn't put that in here because it 
looked a little too gross for that. But um, the big point I want to make here again is that, you know, I know that we want to do our best to conserve the monarch, but all of these insects do play a role in our ecosystem. And they actually do and are pollinators of other wildfires that are present in our native plant communities. So it's kind of like very anthropocentric of us to kind of like, again, glorify monarchs and vilify all these things that affect monarchs. They're all part of the ecosystem. They all play a role. So just because um, we can't see the function they serve or they seem to have quote unquote a bad function or quote unquote, you know, Another one, big one that I see vilified a lot are wasps. Um, they all serve a purpose in our ecosystems and they're all necessary for a healthy ecosystem. So, you know, eliminating one because we don't like what it's doing in our garden doesn't serve our purpose. That is, if you're specifically trying to build a balanced pollinator garden. Um, and just touching on wasps for a bit, I see a lot of people vilify paper wasps when in fact they actually are major pollinators of milkweed. Um, monarchs actually re are really, really bad at pollinating milkweed. They're some of the worst um, pollinators of milkweed. Or, um, and a lot of our wasps are actually some of the best. In fact, again, the, the two videos that I showed you earlier had wasps on them. Moving on. So, we're going to talk about fire a little bit and disturbance because fire um, is a major form of environmental or ecological disturbance that a lot of milkweeds need and depend on. And I just thought this was like perfect because I always think about this whenever I see a burned area. I'm like, how, not necessarily how does it benefit me, but ooh, what's going to be out there re-sprouting, you know, in a few weeks for me to look at. I just, I always get excited, excited when I see a um, burned area because it always means that there's going to be some good stuff blooming and popping up in the next few weeks. So milkweeds in general um, greatly benefit from relatively frequent fires during lightning season. And lightning season happens kind of at the end, basically right now. So anywhere between May, or like as early as um I want to say as early, like the earliest, I want to say is late March, um, but generally um, end of April to um, early June or mid-June. Um, that's the end of our dry season. And during that transition from wet to dry, we have, excuse me, a lot of thunderstorms that come in. And because our ecosystems are so dry, they are prime for light or the um, substrate dead leaf material, et cetera. It's just perfect for a lightning strike. So that was when um, most of our fires happened, you know, over the last uh, 100,000 million years or more. And that's what pretty much all of our um, uh, upland plants are have evolved um, to take advantage of. So um, given the known phenology of a lot of our native plants, and especially our milkweeds, dormancies and burns probably will limit recruitment um, because most of our milkweeds will finish up um, their seed set um, kind of in mid to late fall. And a lot of dormancies and burns happen in mid fall. So if those happen before those milkweeds get a chance to sprout, that means that um, that fire has basically killed that year's generation of new um, seedlings for milkweeds. Um, of course, this also applies to other plants as well, but I digress. Um, a lot of milkweeds, um, their reproduction is um, very quickly stimulated post fire and even post mow, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but in general, fires maintain the overall physical structure of the habitat that milkweeds are found in. And it keeps it you know, really open, really airy. Um, it makes the canopy um, let in a lot more light. It keeps a lot of the big, heavy shrubs from out competing milkweeds because a lot of them don't get to be very large and they can't compete with faster growing shrubs uh, like beautyberry and such, or in some areas, um, fast growing trees like water oak. Um, so that open habitat, uh, like structure and spacing of plants is super important um, for both successful reproduction and recruitment. So, and here's just a really cool picture of um, mini flower grass pink with a fresh fire happening in the background. I just love that picture. 
Um, so this is a photograph that I took. It's Split Oak. Valerie's going to see notice this one. She knows which one this is. I think Ooh. this was about two weeks, right? Two weeks after this fire. Um, so I came out, and, and this is um, at a population that I knew of previously, and I wanted to come out and see like how quickly some of these plants are resprouting. So again, two weeks after a fire, bam, we have regrowth. And not only do we have regrowth, all of these, um, so these are all Asclepias bay or Florida fairy milkweed. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but on the left here, we have a nice, um, you can kind of see the little buds forming there, um, which I will, depending on how much time I have, um, uh, I'll try to touch on like Faye, maybe a little more, but we'll see. But in general, um, like this species, like, sprouted extremely fast after the fire and was like trying to throw flowers out almost immediately. Um, and here's here's what the re-sprout looked like a couple weeks later. Uh, biggest population that I had ever recorded for this species, uh, there's about 600 flags out in this picture. Um, and all the blue flags represent plants. So those are all plants that were either in bud or about to bloom or had blooms. And I believe all the um, pink were, were like vegetative adults and all the um, uh, orange were juvenile plants. So pretty crazy, um, but clearly fire was highly benefiting this plant. So for the reasons that I mentioned before, this means that um, roadsides often end up being a great, quote unquote, quote unquote, great, kind of, sort of, not really. <laughs> place for milkweeds to kind of hang out. Well, milkweed's another sensitive species that like fire and disturbance. Um, and that's because uh, mowing basically simulates fire. Um, and it, keep, it mowing keeps um, the habitat down. And for many milkweeds, or many of the milkweeds that are in these roadsides, um, they respond to mowing just as they would if they were burned. So they end up blooming more profusely or producing more blooms at once. And so that you, you often see this here in the, in the median that I actually just took this picture this past weekend in Highlands County. So um, we're gonna like change gears here a little bit um, to try to talk about something a little bit broader, um, basically biogeography. Um, and this kind of relates to just um, overall conservation and uh, et cetera related to it. And again, this is just another, <laughs> I find this one funny, but so biogeography and why is this important? And I'll tie it into milkweeds here at the end. But in general, it's the study of like, you know, we have here a bunch of blobs on the map, right? Okay. My job as a biogeographer is to look at this map and ask the questions of, okay, so why does number 30 here, why is this blob shaped like that? What is driving this, um, blob shape? Why is there, you know, maybe there is mixing between um, subspecies here, et cetera, but, you know, why, basically the questions are, why is the blob shaped like that? What are the conditions uh, limiting or shaping that blob, um, et cetera? And for animals, um, it's a little harder to do um, than plants because plants don't move. Plants make it really easy for you to do biogeography. And if you know your plants, um, you can really read the landscape like a book, but the image on the right here is all the different kinds of subspecies of white-tailed deer that we have in North America. And basically in general, biogeography integrates concepts from like at least half a dozen different fields, um, but mainly uh, geology, physical geography, ecology overall, evolutionary biology, I can go on. Um, but the general premise is that like species and like their communities or species um, assemblages vary um, very regularly along different kinds of geographic gradients, like elevation or latitude, or you know between different ecosystems, etc. So two great examples of this are, for at least for animals, are Bergman's rule. So a species that is widespread is going to be larger in colder climates and smaller in warmer climates. Um, so you can kind of see this. Um, so the average adult size of deer in Florida is about 125 pounds, but in Idaho, it's 250 to 300 pounds. Great example of Bergman's rule right there. And then key deer, our wonderful, wonderful subspecies, is an example of the island effect uh, or island dwarfism. So bigger species becoming smaller or smaller species 
um, I can't remember the name of the, the second rule, basically smaller species becoming larger. Um, oh yeah, there it goes, Foster's rule, sitting here talking about it. I'm not even looking at my screen, excuse me. So phytogeography is the sub-study uh, focused on plants specifically. And it um, basically, again, it, it's the pattern of the geographic distribution of plants, um, either specific species or a genus of plants or plant communities across the landscape at different scales. So it can be at you know the global scale, like we see on this map of um, different hickory species, both um, current extant species and ancient species, or it can be at the scale of the state, or it can be at the scale of a county, or it can even be at the scale of like a couple of acres or less. Um, other major concepts in phytogeography that are incorporated are plant ecology, paleobotany, um, so historic distributions of, the, of plants, plant geography, blah, blah, blah. And this is a big one, plant sociology. So plant associations and communities, meaning like, okay, here's, here's this rare species. What are its neighbors that it's most commonly found with? Um, and so all of those can combine to um, start talking about um, things like endemism or um, patterns of endemism, but we'll get to that in a second. So the basic data elements of uh, phytogeography are occurrence records. In other words, you know, things like um, botanical specimens or iNaturalist records even. Both of those work just fine, but it's all primarily about presence or absence of a species, not necessarily about like how many there are in a specific area. Um, and it's used to often con uh, construct floristic provinces. So like, again, ranges where we're gonna see like certain kinds of species assemblages and stuff. Oops. Um, and you can kind of see, like, this is a great example. I, I love this picture. So this is um, taken, I took this picture um, in a helicopter heading out into Big Cypress. And you can kind of see the shape of the cypress domes as you look to, towards the horizon here. And you'll notice that the, um, the eastern, or I think in this case, it's the northern edge in this photograph, um, is actually steeper than the left side in the photograph of these cypress stones. And if you look at these cypress stones from an aerial photograph, you can actually see how they kind of trail southward um, following the, the flow of water that has happened in the Everglades for millennia. It's really, really cool. Um, if any of you guys have time after this presentation to take a look at um, Google Maps or Google Earth via satellite, zoom in on, um, big cypress and you can see how these cypress domes look at um, a larger scale, super neat. And again, here's another um, example of phytogeography at a smaller scale. This is just kind of a basic, very basic map of plant communities. So they're all, plant communities are, it's just a group or an assemblage of plant species that are found together in a specific area. Um, and it's often, at a smaller scale than um, like a region. So like a region would encompass like, you know, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, et cetera, or, you know, central Florida, excuse me. And these communities tend to be fairly uniform and they're influenced by various factors, such as like the kind of soil that they're on, the topography or elevation, um, the kind of climate they receive is, you know, wet, dry, uh, snowy, hot, cold, um, hydrology or disturbance, et cetera. And they can be described in terms of, you know, all kinds of terms, such as like their physical structure or the kinds of species it contains. Um, but the big key here in general is that a plant community itself can be rare, even if none of the species that are, that comprise it or define it are rare. Um, and the condition, because the conditions that created that specific plant community um, may be super duper unique. So um, one great example of like kind of combining all these concepts we just talked about is um, what's called a biodiversity hotspot. And it's an area with high endemism and, but also high habitat loss. And I think the um, numbers are basically, if an area or region has greater than 1500 species and more than 90% habitat loss, it uh, qualifies as a biodiversity hotspot. And in 2016, the coastal plain area, including much of Florida, um, was um, registered or 
officially named as the 30, number 36 on the list of biodiversity hotspots. And, oh, excuse me, greater than 70%. So this whole region um, has suffered about, I wanna say 90% habitat loss because the, the major um, plant community in this region was the longleaf pine forest, um, but that's a different discussion. So here's, here's a great example of this. Like a lot of these um, pine forests, pine flatwoods, um, pine savannas, grasslands, et cetera, whatever you wanna call them, whatever type they are, often have really, really high herbaceous uh, plant and grass diversity. And this is, again, going back to what we talked about at the very beginning, this is what milkweeds love. Um, and what we're looking at here, this is an Apalachicola National Forest, and I'm standing in um, kind of like a, I want to say music to wet uh, grassland, but this is a, definitely an area where I have, where I was uh, finding and taking pictures of Asclepius virigula, which is a species that is basically near endemic to Florida. I think it's only found in like maybe one county in either Alabama or Georgia. I can't remember which one, but um, yeah, anyway. So some other, um, some examples of endemics here. This is, I think, Platanthera. Oh, goodness. I want to say this is either, this is Cristata. I don't know, there's three, there's three of these orange fringe joy. I know, Valerie, I, this is so bad. I, should, I remember taking this picture. I just don't remember the species, but I know there's like at least three of them. And I think they're all pretty much uh, either near endemics or endemics to this, this region. Um, this is another uh, ground orchid that's um, pretty much endemic to um, the Southeast. Um, so when it comes to milkweeds, there's about 17 milkweed species that are endemic to the coastal plain. Um, two of which are only found in Florida. So um, right here is a county level range map of um, savanna milkweed on the left. So um, areas that are denoted in green, it just kind of means it's like, oh, hey, we found it here. And all the areas that are um, in yellow, it's considered a um, like a rare or endangered or threatened species in those states. So some broader implications about all this um, stuff as it relates to milkweeds is that we are losing habitat and species in Florida at a very rapid pace. So habitats that milkweed are found in range anywhere from G5, S5. So G5, global, globally secure, um, S is state, so state secure to um, G1, S1. And one is denotes um, critically imperiled habitat. So this is just kind of like a, a, a modeled example of what, what we're talking about here. And this is just between 1900 and 1992. And I, I know pretty much all of us here in um, viewing this presentation know that even from 1992, it's changed way, way more um, than, than it has. So those, all of those wet, or all, many of those, these habitats have shrunk even further beyond um, that map there. Um, and then here, here we go. This is uh, the toll road. I don't know where it's at again because it's popped up again in the last like how many years has this has this been going on, Val? I think Four. these first came in 2020. Yeah, I think 2020 was yeah. the MCORS toll roads. <sighs> yeah, could we not overdevelop rural land or just like nice habitat for like five minutes in this state? Like I don't know. Kind of drives me nuts. Um, but. One of the cooler implications and one of the reasons why I like to study milkweeds is that like we have 21 species, right? And each of them is found like they're not like even the species that have big, broad distributions are still found in specific habitats in Florida. So they can be used to identify key habitats for preservation and help inform management of um you know, not just the milkweed species that's found in that habitat, but all the other species that are found with it. Um, because again, it's not like milkweeds aren't like this core component of a plant community. They are, you know, just kind of, um, they are a plant that is a member of that community, um, but they're often uncommon in the, uncommon to rare in plant, uh, said plant communities. Um, but if you are managing them properly to the point where they actually are, you know, blooming regularly, they are making seed regularly and they're being utilized frequently, you can generally assume that all the other even more sensitive plant and or animal species that are in that habitat and or using that habitat are also being taken care of by the management, um, land management techniques that are being employed as well. 
So, and this here, um, so this is a picture um, by Edwin Bridges of Arisida Bayrichiana. So this was a burn that was done, I think in uh, late into the wet season. Um, and what happened here, so all of these little lumps here, these are all aris so basically Arista Bay Ricciana is um, Florida's wiregrass. Um, it was recently split from Arista stricta. Um, but all these little tiny lumps here that don't have like uh, green coming out of them, those are all dead clumps of wiregrass. And they're dead because this area was burned again, late in the wet season. Um, so it rained way too much and the plants as they were re-sprouting essentially drowned. Here we have um, a population of um, Aristida Bay Ricciana that was burned during transition season. And you can see that these plants are doing way, way better. Um, one thing that a lot of bio or botanists are noticing is that um, habitats that are burned consistently and you know not just once or twice over a few decades um, or a few years rather, but over decades, um, these plant communities that used to be like grassy and full of wildflowers and other herbaceous species and grasses are shifting from that grassy herbaceous dominance to shrubby dominance because shrubs keep growing throughout the year. They just kind of slow down or our native shrubs sl just slow down for the most part during the winter time. Um, whereas most of our um, herbaceous species just kind of take a, a complete break. So burning during winter time favors all these shrubs. And if, you, if it's done constantly over decades, again, it shifts from grass to, to shrub, which is not good for a lot of the herbaceous species that need those nice open habitats. So tying this back into the biogeography here and our milkweeds, um, most of the milkweeds that you're going to see in central Florida are deciduous and die back in the winter. And when they re regrow, they tend to reach a, max, reach a max size for that season. So, and it, it, it all depends on what species that, um, or it depends on the species, how big or tall they get. But they rarely, if ever, you know, extend beyond um, that max size, so to speak. Um, there is anecdotal evidence that um, upland species can live for a very, very long time. Um, there are at least two papers that suggest that the minimum age for, um, for example, butterfly weed or Asclepias tuberosa and Curtis's milkweed or Asclepias curtisii, the minimum age is 20, can be 25 years or more. So, um, and moving on, most species have actually re uh, relatively narrow habitat preferences, making them, again, great indicators of specific habitats or um, plant communities or what have you. So what we have here on the right, um, is just a snippet of Bon Boyette Scrub Preserve. I think this is um, in Hillsborough County, if I remember correctly. And all of the um, blue dots indicate Curtis's milkweed. And then there's a transition here between the scrub that Curtis's milkweed is pretty much only found in. And there's like, I think this is a little creek or a seep here. So the orange here indicates Asclepias fei, which is kind of, um, it's, tend, it's found in dry flatwoods mostly, and it tends to overlap a little bit with um, Asclepias pedicillatus preferred habitat, which is mostly mesic flatwoods. So you can kind of see the both of them clustering on the edge of the scrub here where it's a little um, wetter. Um, and anyway, you see what I'm talking about. So moving on to the species. So the first species, there's about 14 species found in your area, um, and I tried, to focus on species in a um, like like in Osceola County and adjacent counties that you may encounter um, in the woods. So the first on the list is clasping milkweed, and you can definitely tell um, clasping milkweed by the fact that it has big, wide leaves. Sometimes the leaves are or the edges of the leaves are wavy, like you see in the photograph. Um, but they all pretty much always clasp that stem there. Um, from what I remember, most of the time they bloom in the panhandle. Oh, there's a species distribution map, excuse me. They bloom in the panhandle, like I want to say, like midsummer, early to midsummer. Um, and they can actually get to be kind of tall and lanky looking. Um, and they'll make like sometimes a couple of flower clusters, like one to three um, for the most part. And they always have this like, it looks like fireworks really when it blooms. The, all the flowers always have like long stalks to them. Um, and they're just, they're just a really cool species. I like them a lot. 
<clears throat> there was um, a little bit of discussion in um, one of the Facebook groups, I believe it's Florida Flora and Ecosystematics, um, that there may be a difference between the coastal plain clasping mm -hmm. milkweed and the clasping milkweed ecotype that's found in the Midwest, as our species are primarily found in sandhill habitats with like, you know, oak, pine, oak and pine canopy. Um, and in the Midwest, there's like, they're pretty much found strictly in prairie habitat that has absolutely no canopy cover and they only ever make one one singular inflorescence whenever they bloom whereas ours will make you know one to three or more so another um, species that you'll encounter is large flower milkweed this is one that likes acidic kind of wet to mesic habitats um, i wish i had like a, a list of uh, species that um, occur with it but um, up in the panhandle, I've seen it a lot with, it's not like growing in the same exact spot as pitcher plants do, but it definitely likes it um, kind of on the outside of those wetter areas that pitcher plants like. Um, it's definitely not a species that likes it dry um, and it's not often encountered. I honestly think um, it's one of the um, species that has the fewest botanical vouchers in the state. So again, you can see the um other stuff and the flowers themselves are at least like an inch long or an inch across i um, mean i wanted to include some pictures of like what the the leaves look like they tend to be small and kind of like almost lean against the stem there a bit um but the plant can be kind of hard to notice when it's not in bloom amongst all the grass that it grows in so here's another example of that here um and this is uh, one of our endemic species here, Curtis's milkweed. Um, it is not found anywhere else in the world, only in Florida, and it is only found in scrub. Um, it, within scrub, it's it's pretty tough to spot when it's not in bloom. It um, does have one thing that I like to point out about the species. It does have a really, really, really variable leaf morphology, and I think that it it's like that because if it's if it happens to grow in like a sandy gap or establish itself in a sandy gap, um, and it's just starting to grow for the season, they tend to have much skinnier leaves than like later on in the season. Um, I guess they tend to widen out or what have you. But um, those skinnier leaves actually reduce the amount of um, sunlight they get, um, minimizing the surface area. So it reduces water loss. Um, so basically it's, I think the variable leaf morphology is like an adaptation to deal with like the super duper harsh environment that's, that they grow in, which is like scrub is just like, it's brutal. Let me tell you. So, and here's just an awesome picture. I just, I love this picture. Um, I think, the, yeah, I took this in Highlands County, but um, one way that um, you can tell it apart from other plants that you're going to see in the scrub is that um, <laughs> because I get it confused with another fun species, um, which is uh, pa phase palafox. Um, phase palafox also has that same um, opposite leaf arrangement, but this species is the only one that when you touch the leaf, it's going to be baby soft. It's not gonna be scratchy or leathery or, or anything like that. It's just gonna have nice soft leaves. And here we go, Florida fairy milkweed. Um, I love and hate this plant. It's awesome, but a pain in the butt to find. And I honestly think it's um, a fairly sensitive species too. Um, also forgot to mention for Curtis's milkweed, it's our, um, it's state endangered. So for this one, um, a couple of years ago, FNPS was gonna attempt to list this. They um, put it forward and it didn't get approved, um, but I put forward an application to get this species listed in 2021. And um, the Florida Endangered Plant Advisory Council voted to list this species as threatened. Um, at the state level. So hopefully we'll be seeing that update soon. Um, the species is mostly found in like, again, dry flatwoods with a very, very open canopy. Like there's rarely ever any trees above it. Um, and it's really hard to kind of describe the plant community that is found in other than like, you're gonna see a lot of species that prefer, that grow in flatwoods, but they like it drier than wet. Um, and as you can tell by this picture, uh, I had to pick the one species out of all the milkweeds that I could have studied for my graduate thesis, the one species that looks like wire grass when it's not in bloom. Go me. <laughs> so it's really, really tough to spot when it's not in bloom. And it kind of makes sense as to why um, folks haven't, you know, really noticed it or its ecology um, 
until now because people only incidentally encountered it when they just have it just happened to be in bloom so i just like this picture too because i happen to, to grab it with this um little leaf cutting bee here landing on him um here is another fan favorite i love this one sandtail milkweed has a nice wide distribution coastal plain endemic pretty much found only in the coastal plain but dang is it not pretty um probably one of the most important um milkweeds for the monarch i'll touch on that at least because it's one of the first milkweed species to pop up in the panhandle as the monarchs migrate through that region um the it tends to lay prostrate on the ground um and is found to, it, it can be found either in scrub habitat or sandhill habitat, but it's almost always in dry, sandy soils. Um, kind of tough to grow from seed because of the fact that it makes a very deep taproot, not to mention the fact that like many of these upland plants grow um, in soils that drain very, very quickly. So they can't deal with um, typical nursery conditions um, due to the fact that most nurseries when they grow, um, you know, plants, be them native or not, they'll water them every, almost every single day, if not every other day, and they use the same soil medium for everything. And it, if this species and other upland species don't get a chance to like really have drained soil or dry out just a little bit, um, it very, very quickly leads to rot. But this is just a great photograph of what it typically looks like on the ground. And I just absolutely love that pink and mint uh, coloration that you see. So this is our pink swamp milkweed. Um, and I call Asclepius incarnata specifically swamp milkweed because there's one other species, and we'll get to that one, um, that also occurs in wet habitats, um, but it primarily fires white. So this one, Asclepius incarnata is one that has like a very, very wide distribution almost across the Eastern United States. Um, there seems to be like a bit of a break in the geographic distribution if you look at the, county level maps for um, the US. We don't know if that means that there may be like a genetically distinct population down here or not, but all we all I do know down here is that it does occur in um, primarily like kind of riverine habitats almost alongside um, the edge of the rivers. I see it a lot growing with um, Acer, is it Acer River? Yeah. Red maples and um, willows and stuff like that. Um, not quite as wet as those, but pretty close to it. Um, it can grow easily in straight water. In fact, um, the ones that I'm growing, I pretty much constantly have in a bucket of water. Uh, oops. So here's a nice cluster um, of that. Um, and that's just a really nice pale form of it. So a few flower milkweed is one, as you can see, it's found almost all over the state. Um, but this is one that primarily likes kind of wet to music habitats. Um, makes these, it's called few flower milkweed because the flower clusters tend to only have like, you know, uh, maybe five to 10 flowers um, per cluster. Um, and it tends to grow very tall and skinny and has extremely long skinny leaves. Um, which I didn't capture in these photographs, but here's a, on the left is a photograph from um, that I took from Big Cypress um, uh, with it just kind of like hanging out um, over the top of this. And one of the things I like to think about when I see milkweeds in habitat is like, okay, so what insects are visiting it and like, why might they be visiting it? And going back to one of the earlier slides where I showed you um, some of the butterflies that may visit um, few flower milkweed, which I can't remember if I indicated that, but um, this species, when you look at it in habitat, it's like kind of cresting the top of the grasses out here. Um, so it's like just barely um, over the grasses. So it's one of the few things that the butterflies can see. And so it, the platform that the um, flowers make is also just the right size for a larger butterfly to land on. Um, which going back to that um, earlier slide shows that like those butterfly, those larger butterfly species may be um, or are some of the best pollinators for the specific species, but um, it can also be pollinated by a number of other insects. So it's just a great example of um, how a milkweed can depend upon, or does depend on, you know, a wide variety of habitats in order to be um, successful. Um, so this is um, longleaf milkweed or Asclepias longifolia. 
it makes these really awesome. So this one's primarily found, also found in um, kind of mesic habitats, um, a little bit drier, I want to say, than few flower milkweed. And out in big cypress, you can kind of see this one. Um, it doesn't occur like in the cypress stones. You'll see it like in areas where the grass is like shorter out there. And when I say this, I'm, I'm talking about like areas that um, people rarely go out and mow or do anything with. Um, so I've always seen out in big cypress, this is one that likes lower grasses, um, a little, little tiny bit drier than a um, few flower milkweed, um, but it makes these really cool, I think they look like tiny little rocket ships almost. Um, and the flowers just have, I don't know, I just think they have a nice little arrangement there. But there, this is one of the few um, species of milkweeds that has um, sub opposite leaves. And you can kind of see that in this picture here. So right here, there's a pair. This is, um, you know, single leaf, single leaf, single leaf, single leaf, um, another pair or so up here, et cetera. Um, but it tends to also like um, areas with calcareous um, or basic soils too. And I just thought this was a really cute photograph with the um, tetraopes or four-eyed beetle on here. Savannah milkweed, this is again, another one of the um, coastal plain endemics. And it's, I won't say it's like a near endemic to Florida, but it kind of sort of almost is. This one's just awesome. Uh, it's very, very much likes fire for sure. Um, I, so one of the biologists, um, I think Valerie named him one of the botanical, what did we call those for the conference? Botanical aces? Rockstar roundtable. Rockstars. Native plant rock stars. Yeah, Brett Budach, when I went out with him and Edwin um, a few years ago, he said that he's, one of the first things he does when he sees a flower is smell it. And I, I don't have a strong sense of smell, but because I, and because of that, I've never thought to smell them. But this is one that has a very, in my personal opinion, strong smell. And to me, it smells like grape candy or just a very, very sweet scent to it, um, which uh, I think is pretty interesting because of the fact that like when it's in grasses or trying to bloom in grasses, it's hard to see. So I, I think the strong scent draws a lot of um, bees to it. Um, here's a picture. Um, idea of a plant I think that she either she found on her property or a neighbor's property but that's what it looks like vegetatively and honestly it does not look like much um, which is more than likely the reason why it's another one of those species that goes pretty much unnoticed by people and I, I don't know I just think you can kind of see why it's called pedicillata as well because like unlike other species where that like um, area where the um, stigmatic slit and everything is, is like this nice cylindrical disc. Um, it's actually raised on like a little stem here. You can kind of sort of see it here and you kind of sort of see it there. So it's like this little disc that's raised to the top of the flower and like where the horns and the nectar is, is at the base of the flower. So basically it, any insect that visits this basically has to face, dive face first into the flower and like really dig in there to get at the nectar while kicking at the base of this pedestal. So I've never really seen something forage on it. And I would be really interested to see what, what that looks like in action, you know, cause it's just such a weird flower shape. And I, I have to wonder like what insects, you know, may visit it or if it's like targeting a specific group of insects that need to be, you know, conserved perhaps. Um, so aquatic milkweed, so this is Perennis, your other swamp milkweed, but this one I call, I always try to make the distinction, this is aquatic milkweed because this is the one that you will find in a lot of cypress uh, floodplain forests. Um, it's almost always associated with like creeks, rivers, and streams, and again, in the floodplain. And it is the only species of milkweed that um, when it makes fruit, that fruit does not Again, it does not grow up and down, it hangs straight down. And when those seed pods open up, they don't have fluff in them. All of the seeds just kind of fall out on either onto the ground or if there's water down below, they fall into the water. Um, there was actually a study done um, kind of trying to measure how long those seeds can float for. And they compared it with a terrestrial species. Um, not one of our native species, but they found that milkweed seed or Asclepius perennis seeds can float for up to five months. How cool is that? So that's a really great advantage because that means that like if a flood hap you know, happened 
um, right after it produced seed, those seeds could be carried far away somewhere else um, to colonize new habitat. Super cool advantage in my opinion. Again, here's a distribution map and a nice close up of those pretty awesome flowers. Um, in captivity, this is one of the ones that I think like uh, it pretty much is the one that regularly produces seed for me, especially if I manage to like, I know this sounds counterintuitive, but kind of sort of hiding the plants in your garden um, such that uh, monarchs have a little bit of a tough time trying to find it, but the smaller pollinators can find it pretty easily. I found that to um, easily result in, you know, lots and lots of seed. Um, velvet leaf milkweed, another super cool species. Um, so this is one that is associated primarily with sand hill spaces and a lot of um, what may be ancient um, beach dune or barrier island habitats. So this species, I kind of wish I had time to include like a, a, a US wide or yeah, continental wide map of or distribution map of the species because it occurs in this ridge from South Carolina, North Carolina into Georgia where it seemingly like skips over Georgia and then into Florida where, oops, you can see it cuts off at Liberty uh, County there. Um, and then there's nothing. And then it picks up again in a north south line of counties in East Texas. Like, what the heck's up with that? Um, in like the Carolinas, it's associated with something sand hills called the fall line or on the fall line, which is where like the elevation uh, drops precipitously. And um, it's that fall line is essentially like an ancient um, coastline uh, for the US. Um, up in the Panhandle, it's found on uh, barrier islands and beach dunes. And it's definitely also found along on barrier ridges and dune ridges all throughout um, these counties here. Um, but up in the Panhandle, uh, I before Hurricane Michael hit, I had the idea that, oh my gosh, I should go up there after Hurricane Michael to check and see if these plants that existed there, you know, still pop up, you know, because whenever we have a hurricane, we get storm surge, or at least coastal areas get storm surge. And so that's going to result in like a ton of salt water into those um, habitats that are super close to the coast. And right here in, um, you know, these Wakala County and these other counties here, um, some of the habitats that have velvet leaf milkweed are within a couple, like maybe a dozen yards of the beach. You're like you can, like the uh, or the water is basically a stone's throw from the plant itself. So I went up there in February, the February after Hurricane Michael hit, and went back to some of the plants um, that I um, remember. Uh, recording up there. And I had also talked to some of the locals and they said they got about three to four feet of storm surge. And so at that, and at that point in time, they had um, gotten, oh, I think they said that they ha still had plants dying months later due to all the salt water that had penetrated um, the soil layer there. And again, this grows in basically sand hill or scrub otherwise. Um, so that means the water is going to go very quickly take, uh, drain down into that um, sugary sand. And when I went back there, I um, dug down um, to check the roots to see if they were still alive or if they were dying. And all the ones that I checked that February were still alive. And I actually found one that was starting to re-sprout. So this is a species that is likely um, to be somewhat salt tolerant. And uh, frankly, this is another uh, line of research that I think would be really, really cool to do or have time to do, if I had time or funding to do. Um, Cause I mean, salt tolerant milkweed, that's just, that's just really cool. <laughs> um, butterfly weed or Asclepias tuberosa. This is one that is um, found almost throughout the entire United States. It, I think it gets as far West as like Arizona and stuff, maybe more. Um, there is a minimum, oh gosh, I don't know of any, I don't know what the um, subspecies are outside of Florida, <laughs> but there's about two, um, two to three recognized subspecies in Florida right now. There's a potential fourth though that's on um, the Lake Wales Ridge or Avon Park Ridge. Um, so there is Asclepias tuberosa. So the primary one subspecies that you're going to see is Rolfsii. 
There is also subspecies interior, um, subspecies tuberosa, and the new one that's on the Lake Wales Ridge um, or, and in, or in Avon Park that hasn't been named yet. Um, the leaf shape can kind of like be a little bit variable, but, and this is one of the few species that doesn't make, make latex at all. So um, uh, it also tends to have um, a sub opposite leaf. So it can be a little hard to identify, um, but with, with enough time and study, um, it, it becomes pretty easy at least. <sighs> I mean, I shouldn't be saying that because I've been at this for God knows how long. <laughs> Okay, world milkweed, um, second to last one. So this is one that's gonna be uh, way more distinctive than a lot of the other ones. And um, so it's called verticillata because you don't have just one pair of leaves at a node, you have anywhere between three to four. Um, and you can see the typical floral arrangement here. Um, I usually see this one and much like tubero the previous one, tuberosa, this is one that you'll find either in very dry flatwoods, um, dry to music flatwoods, scrubs, sand hill, um, mostly dry upland habitats. And going back to tomentosa, same thing. Tomentosa is mainly sand hill um, or more so sand hill than scrub. Verticillata, mostly sand hill, although in Miami-Dade County, there is uh, there, like the one in my, like Miami-Dade County's Asclepias verticillata look really ugly and scraggly. I hate to say it like that, but they look way different than um, a lot of the sand hill um, ecotypes that I see in kind of like central Florida. Um, so I think that there uh, may be a distinctive um, subspecies or variety there in Miami-Dade County. I've also encountered one in Southwest Florida that, um, so most of the other ecotypes of this species do produce latex. So when, if you, tear a leaf off, it's going to bleed uh, white. Whereas the ones that I've seen in Southwest Florida, um, actually not only are they not world, in other words, they're paired leaves here, um, they also don't bleed latex. And they're also growing in like a mesic to wet-ish habitat, unlike all these other dry habitats that this one's found in. So either there's a subspecies or something going on there, but, um, that remains to be seen and without genetic evidence and sitting there and reviewing like, you know, the God knows how many botanical specimens that are from, uh, you know, not just all over Florida, but like basically the Eastern US, uh, we won't know for sure. Um, this is an, an example of one from like the panhandle. I think this is one that um, I, I, I believe Floyd Griffith took this photograph and this is probably from that, uh, a population up there. And I think this is one that's occurring kind of like close to limestone glades. So this may be like a third ecotype of this species. I don't know. Verticillite is a species of milkweed, again, that's just found all over the Eastern US. And I'm pretty sure there's at least a couple of other milkweed species that have been split off from this for one reason or another. So yeah, more remains to be done on this um, for us to know for sure. And last but certainly not least, with the weirdest distribution in Florida of all, this one, just like, I look at this map and I'm just sitting here like WTF is going on here. Like, why, why do we have it in just like Monroe County and Miami-Dade County? Like, what the heck, did we, did we lose something here? I'm sure we did. We definitely lost a bunch of stuff here, but like, did we actually? Was there some kind of like habitat that, I don't know. So long story short, Green antelope horn really likes exposed limestone and is found primarily in basic habitats. So Miami-Dade County has pine rockland, which you know, basically has pines coming out of straight limestone rock, among other things. And you get those um, kinds of habitats also in the Gainesville area too, and up here in kind of like Liberty County. And I can't, God, I, can't, I should remember this county. I lived up there for so long and now I can't remember it. Anyway, there's glades up in this county too. Um, which is where limestone comes super close to the surface, um, preventing any kinds of trees from actually growing in that area and basically creating like a miniature little prairie there. So um, Beardus tends to prefer those areas. So I, I really wanna know what the heck's going on here, if, if there's actually like this big of a gap there or not. But again, another line of research that remains to be seen, um, pending time, you know, money, et cetera. 
Um, so yeah, here's what it looks like when it's in bloom. And here's just a nice, super cool zoom in of that flower. And again, going back to all the stuff, species that we've seen so far, you can see like the, just the absolute sheer variation in um, floral morphology is like just bonkers to me. I think it's great. Anyway, that said, thank you for listening. I know I went over, um, but questions. Yes, okay, so uh, we have some questions. Well, okay, Fitztastico, whoever that is, says, any tips for growing milkweed in containers? I've heard it can be difficult for many of the varieties, but I'm attempting to grow multiple species of the same clay to try hybridizing them. Oh, woohoo, hybridizing, good luck. You're gonna need a microscope, something really teeny tiny to get in there and pull that thing out. Cause let me tell you, it took me like at least five to 10 minutes just to get like the tropical milkweed pollinia out. And then you have to stick it back in that, that, that hole again which, uh, yeah, first off, good luck with hybridizing because uh, it'd be kind of cool to make some really cool combinations of stuff. Um, but for hybridizing doesn't necessarily have like uh, too much ecological value, but it, it would be, I don't know. Anyway, with regards to growing um, the species themselves, it all depends upon um, the habitat they grow in. So, knowing how to grow the plants uh it helps to know where they like to grow and where you've seen them before so i encourage you to go out hike in your area um, look for them keep tabs on them mentally or otherwise um, use iNaturalist for sure and make recording like record where you find it i also if you do that um i would be aware that um that app has been used for poaching in the past so i do encourage people to um well huh, as somebody who uses iNaturalist data for their research i i it's frustrating when people obscure their observations but i do have to um, encourage people to obscure their observations um of milkweeds just because um, there has been some reports of poaching, um, at least in the panhandle, uh, if not elsewhere. I digress. The point is, is that if you record the observations, take a look at the habitat they're in. What other plants are growing with them? Um, does it seem to be dry? Does it seem to be wet? What kind of soil is it? Um, you don't have to like fully replicate the soil so much as like, I, I feel like for me, from what I've encountered, the big ones are like how wet the soil is or the, the hydrology, so to speak, of whatever you're putting it in, right? And then the pH of the soil. So if you take like Asclepius fei, the species that we're looking at on the screen, and you try to put it in a soil that has um, a mix that's too basic, the plants are going to come up chlorotic. Um, and I found that I've had to swap them from, because I have them in a, a richer uh, soil mix with extra compost in them, to a more, um, basically a super nutrient poor mix, like a carnivorous plant mix. Um, of course, I wasn't able to get these seedlings to any measurable size, but prior to them like passing out on me, um, they greened up really well with a carnivorous plant mix of peat, perlite, and pool sand. Again, super nutrient poor. Um, I Right now I'm attributing that to um, the fact that the compost I was using had a bunch of, I, I often would find lime rocks in it, which more than likely made it too basic for that particular species. So again, it all boils down to knowing um, where the species occurs and um, what kind of soil and or habitat it, that's in and you know just doing your best to kind of mildly replicate it i think that most of these plants can tolerate a little more um than we think they can but they do require a little bit of extra tlc and they can't tolerate a lot especially the upland ones can't tolerate like being watered like every single day you know so i hope that helps a bit and uh if you're an fnps member we have a really good talk on our uh members only lunch and learns about um uh, sandhill milkweed, propagating sandhill milkweed, and he includes tips on, um, he's, he's done research on mixing uh, soil for potting milkweed up, so that would be a good one to watch if you are a member. And if you are not a member, you can join and send me an email, communications at fmps.org, and I'll send you a link to that video. 
Um, Mike Dotram asks, are there better milkweed to grow in a s- typical suburban yard? Uh, trying to turn my side yard into wildflower field, and it's fairly dry and sunny, but not sandy. Mm, aquatic milkweed or, um, so Asclepius perennis or Asclepius incarnata. Um, th- both, of the one- both of those are ones that I think are most commonly propagated by native nurseries because they're some of the easiest ones to grow. I think followed by that, um, Occasionally, you can find nurseries that have propagated Asclepius tuberosa, although that one definitely prefers it to be, like, dry and well-drained. So, like, if you have a dry spot, you want to make sure that it doesn't – because that's the other big thing that, again, people run into is they don't realize, like, how their the soil in their yard drains. Um, so there's, like, a spot in my parents' front yard where it's always wet and moist. So I would never put any dry up – I would definitely use um, like a, a species that likes it more music. So um, yeah, definitely the first two species. Oh, Bert- Asclepius reticulata might also be pretty good too. Um, but frankly, I, and I know this is like uh, probably not good. I don't know how good of advice this is, but like the best I can suggest is just like, if you get the milkweed, try to stick it in the ground and see how it does. Um, because I don't know how much um, full-blown research has been done to ha- like specifically determine like you know I guess the moisture limits if that makes sense I don't know did, did that I hope that <laughs> was a very rambling reply and I hope it made sense mm-hmm. um, yeah I mean you might also try butterfly milkweed I mean that is yes like dry and sandy but also it's not like sandhill milkweed it's it's not as good yeah, as but AI. butterfly. I've, I've grown, um, butterfly milkweed in like super rich soil with like lots of compost. And I was able to get that to be almost pretty much bloom size, um, in a few months, uh, with that. It's the, the key for that one was just making sure that it had well-drained soil and it wasn't like in anything that was holding water. Cause anytime you have these upland species in a thing that is holding, um, a bunch of water or doesn't or retains a bunch of water um, it's just le- it just can lead to rot um, and they can't tolerate that very well all right uh, that's all the questions thank you Kara oh that was easy okay cool I'm glad I'm glad you liked it and I hope I was able to like kind of give you all like a basic overview and like you know why I don't know why they're cool. <laughs> I think they're great. And I wish there um, was more time to do more research. But uh, one great way you can help with um, research is more more iNaturalist observations. All of those things do help um, actual researchers. Um, and the more data you get, um, or the more data that's on there, um, the better that we can um, you know, map and understand these species. So. Yep, got some uh, kudos coming in from the from the chat. So I think this is a well enjoyed program. Great job, Kara. Good. You. You're very welcome. Thanks again. All right. Uh, I hope everyone has a great night, and um, see you soon. I hope.